chapter five, uh, biodiversity species interactions and population control. This first presentation is gonna be dealing with topic 5.1, which is how do species interact? So let's talk more about how species get along together in ecosystems. Uh, you, you probably recall from biology class uh, that a group of organisms of the same species is called a population. And when populations of different species occupy the same geographic area, they form a community. And every species within a community has an ecological niche, which is described as the total sum of a species use of the living and non-living resources in its environment. Uh, so really when we get into talking about uh, species interactions, biodiversity obviously comes into play population control will come into play. So the first thing that we're going to wind up discussing are the types of interactions. After talking about types of interactions, we're going to talk about resource sharing, uh, a predator-prey relationship, and we're also going to talk about competition. So let's talk about species interactions. First thing we want to talk about when we talk about species interactions is we're going to talk about competition. Okay. Competition arises when two individuals, uh, whether it be of the same species or of different species, are competing for resources in the environment. When the two individuals that are competing are of the same species, this is called intraspecific competi competition, intraspecific, within the same species. And when they are of different species, it is called interspecific competition. Uh, the resources that are competed for, you can be dealing with food, air, shelter, sunlight, and various other factors necessary for life. Uh, individuals could be competing to live in a fallen tree. They could be competing to catch a running rabbit or to mate with the most desirable female in the population. All of that part is competition. I guess all of that would be considered resources. Uh, but the, comp the competitor who is quote unquote most fit eventually wins and obtains the resource. And others are basically eliminated by the competition. Uh, another thing to remember about competition, when two different species in a region compete and the better adapted species wins, this is what's called competitive exclusion. Uh, no two species can occupy the same niche at the same time, and the species that is less fit to live in the environment will eventually relocate, it'll die out, or it will go on to occupy a smaller niche. When a species occupies a smaller niche than it would in absence of competition, the compromised niche is called its realized niche. The niche it would have, have if there was no competition whatsoever, whatsoever is called its fundamental niche. Um, direct competition can also be avoided, and that's going to be in the case of resource partitioning, which we'll talk about later. So let's talk about predation. Uh, predation happens when um, a member of one species, which is the predator, winds up feeding directly um, on all or a part of a member of another species, which is the prey. So in an example I'm going to show you, uh, those two species together, like a brown bear and a salmon, wind up forming a predator-prey relationship. In this case, um, the picture you're seeing here is in Alaska, um, and basically what happens is the bear will catch the salmon and eat it. Uh, so um, you have this predator-prey relationship. So we've got a couple of different types of predators. You can consider herbivores and carnivores both to be predators. And in this table here on the screen, I've talked about a couple of methods of predation. Uh, you can simply, you know, herbivores can simply walk up to a plant and eat it. Um, carnivores, they can either pursue or they can ambush or they can camouflage themselves so they can surprise and ambush their, their, um, their prey. Uh, they can use chemicals to stun or... Um, sedate their prey so they can go and, and, and eat it as well. Um, but along with predation, uh, you do have uh, these uh, predator-prey relationships, and prey actually wind up do, developing protective mechanisms. Um, and some of the protective mechanisms here are, are, are found in your book. Um, you've got organisms like the span, the span worm and wandering leaf insect that actually camouflage themselves so they can hide themselves from their predators. Uh, the bombardier beetle, the monarch butterfly, the poison dart frog, all of them have uh, chemicals which can either be foul tasting or actually venomous um, or actually a, a spray of a chemical, very much like a skunk, uh, will use chemical warfare to protect itself from its predators. Um, you've got uh, warning coloration, you know, bright colors like the poison dart frog or the monarch butterfly. 
um, to warn off predators. It makes it look more intimidating or, or scary than, than actually it, they are. Uh, you have something like mimicry. Uh, if you look at D and F over there on the right-hand side, uh, the viceroy butterfly looks a lot like the monarch butterfly. And organisms have learned over long periods of time that the monarch butterfly doesn't taste very good. It's got that foul taste to it. So the viceroy butterfly actually um, winds up protecting itself because it does kind of look like the monarch. Um, you've got deceptive looks, like the low moth down there in G. Um, the wings actually look like eyes of a much larger animal. And then you've got deceptive behavior, the snake caterpillar. When it gets touched, um, basically it changes its shape to look like the head of a snake. So all of these things have developed over time to where uh, these prey can actually protect themselves better. So interactions between predator and prey species can actually drive um, the evolution of those organisms. Uh, here we're dealing with the concept of coevolution. And coevolution basically it, it has when you have populations of two different species interacting in a certain way over a really long period of time, changes in the gene pool of each one of those species um, can wind up leading to changes in the other. Uh, here's an example. Um, basically, the changes that take place um, basically help both of those species to become more competitive or to help them avoid competition or avoid being preyed upon. Um, and here is the, the, the bat and moth example from your book. Basically what's happening here is the fact that um, the bat is on the right is hunting a moth. Uh, but the long-term interactions between these two organisms um, can lead to coevolution. So the bats wind up evolving traits that help increase their chance of eating a meal. And the moths wind up evolving traits to help them avoid being eaten. And that's what we see here in this picture. So the next thing we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about symbiotic relationships. Okay, um, Basically, symbiotic relationships are uh, close, prolonged associations between two or more different organisms of different species uh, that could, but they don't necessarily benefit each member. Uh, there are three different types of symbiotic relationships. You're going to have to be familiar with all three of these and really be able to, to recognize uh, each one. Um, mutualistic symbiotic relationships or mutualism, where both sides benefit. You've got commensalism, where one organism benefits and the other organism is neither helped nor hurt. And then parasitism, and parasitism is where uh, one species is harmed and the other benefits. So let's talk about mutualism first. Uh, in mutualism, you've got two species behaving in ways that benefit both by providing each with food, shelter, or some other resource. Um, an example of this uh, is an example between the sea anemone uh, and clownfish. The clownfish protects the sea anemone from some of its predators, while the stinging cells of the anemone protect the clownfish. Uh, the fish is also able to eat some of the detritus that's left behind when the anemone feeds. Okay. Uh, another one you have here in the left-hand corner is you have uh, the oxpeckers and a black, a black rhinoceros. So basically what happens is the birds feed on parasitic ticks um, that show up on these rhinos. So the birds are actually helping the rhinos out by getting those ticks off of them, but then they're also filling their stomachs. Uh, another example of a mutualistic relationship is this one, the hummingbird. The hummingbird benefits uh, by feeding on the nectar in this flower, and then it benefits the flower because it, the flower winds up getting pollinated. The next relationship we're going to talk about is commensalism. Um, an example of this type of relationship it exists between trees and epiphytes, but basically what it is, it's an interaction that benefits one species but really doesn't have much effect on another. Um, again, the epiphytes example. Um, the trees are not affected uh, by the epiphytes growing in them, and the epiphytes benefit by collecting water that runs down the bark, and they get better access to light than they would on the ground. So basically, in this picture from your book on page 111, um, this is an example of commensalism. Uh, uh, the, uh, the epiphyte, the air plant there on the tree trunk, uh, this is a picture in Brazil's Atlantic Tropical Rainforest. Basically what it does is it roots on the trunk of the tree rather than in the soil, and it doesn't penetrate or harm the tree. So here, the epiphyte, like I said before, gains access to sunlight, water, nutrients from the tree, and the tree really remains unharmed and doesn't gain a benefit at all. 
Finally, we're going to talk about parasitism, and that basically occurs when one species, which is the parasite, uh, it feeds on another organism, the host, usually by living inside the host, but sometimes not all the time. So uh, what we have here is a picture from your book. Um, we've got the blood-sucking uh, parasitic sea lamprey, um, and it's attached itself to an adult lake trout. So in this parasitic relationship, uh, one species is harmed, in this case the trout is being harmed, um, while the other, be other benefits. Another example would be uh, the relationship that exists between fleas and dogs. Okay, The fleas obviously benefit from that situation while the dogs are harmed. So let's talk about sharing of resources um, or resource partitioning. Um, basically what resource partitioning is, is when uh, different species, when different species use slightly different parts of the habitat, uh, but they all rely on the same resource. For example, uh, the five species of warblers that we're seeing right here, they can all live in the same pine tree. And they coexist because each species feeds in a different part of the tree, the trunk, the ends of the branches, other sides. Okay, um, So it's easy to observe this competition, but also uh, another way of, of being able to observe it is actually looking at over a long period of time and the development of specialized ecological niches. And this uh, specialized ecological niche is perfectly um, illustrated in something that you guys actually talked about with your, with your Hawaiian uh, birds presentations. So you have these uh, honey creepers, and through natural selection, uh, different species of honey creepers have developed specialized ecological niches that reduced competition between the species. So each species has evolved a specialized beak to take advantage of certain types of food resources. Um, so you've got your fruit and your seed eaters, obviously with smaller beaks, and the insect and nectar eaters are developing longer beaks. Well, that's all I have for you. I'm going to go ahead and post the uh, link to the video, the, the quiz on the video and the reading for Topic 5.1, and I will continue to work on Topic 5.2 and 5.3. Thanks so much.